The following is an EWTN special presentation. I don't think our next speaker ne needs any introduction to any of you, but nevertheless, I'll do it. Um, <laughs> Uh, as you know, Archbishop Gomez is uh, the Archbishop of, uh, of Los Angeles, and I think uh, most of you know him personally and what a, a good leader and, and a pastoral leader and, and, uh, he is and, and an inspired leader for the heart of the church. Um, Archbishop Gomez experienced really uh, a meteoric rise through the episcopacy after he um, was uh, ordained through the Opus Dei pre pre Prelature and uh, in uh, 2001 became the, uh, the auxiliary bishop of uh, Denver, and then he became the uh, archbishop of uh, San Antonio in 2005. 2010 was appointed to be uh, coadjutor bishop uh, here in Los Angeles, and then in 2011, the archbishop of Los Angeles. I think all of you know the impact that uh, he has already made in the whole area of immigration and vocation promotion and of course, he helped to organize CALL, the um, Catholic Association of Latino Leaders, bringing together so many bishops and Latino leaders and into this very powerful organization now that represents uh, the Latino uh, leadership uh, around the United States. So it is a great honor uh, to introduce to you today, once again, Archbishop Gomez. Thank you. Thank you, Father Spitzer. Good afternoon to everyone. Very happy to be with all of you today uh, for uh, at the beginning of uh, our Napa Institute conference. I uh, noticed that um, the theme for today is the, san is the sanctity of work. So um, I uh, wanted to speci especially talk about the spirituality of work, but then I realized that uh, there is another uh, topic that uh, I think it is very important for us as we are uh, consider the uh, sanctity of work, and that's the dignity of the human person. A few years ago, I was invited to uh, um, uh, uh, write an essay for the uh, University of Notre Dame Journal of Law, Ethics, and Public Policy, precisely about the sanctification of uh, the spirituality of work. Uh, and they were nice enough to uh, publish it in that uh, um, uh, journal, so uh, you want to know a little more of what uh, I think about the spirituality of work, uh, uh, may I suggest to you to, uh, 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 I guess, go online and try to see if the, spiritual, the uh, University of Notre Dame still has that uh, little essay. If not, I'll be happy to send it to, uh, to you because um, I have some extra copies. <laughs> Since uh, not too many people were interested, but uh, uh, that it's kind of part of my um, my spirituality, because uh, as Father Spitzer said, I'm a, a, a priest of uh, the Prelature of Opus Dei, and one of the central messages of Opus Dei is precisely the sanctification of work, uh, the spirituality of work. Saint Jose Maria Escrivá, the founder of Opus Dei, was specifically uh, uh, interested in helping us to understand the importance of sanctification of work in our lives. But today. I wanted to talk to you about the vision of human nature and the human person that we find in the scriptures and in Catholic moral and social teaching. As we all know, Pope Francis has been urging the church to renew its attention on people and the dignity of the person. In his inaugural homily, he spoke of the need for us to protect people and to show loving concern for each and every person. And unfortunately, this discussion has become urgent in light of the recent Supreme Court decisions on marriage and continuing develop developments in, in our culture. One of those issues that is in front of us is the issue of uh, immigration reform. And it was very impressive to me to uh, see the Holy Father, Pope Francis, go to uh, the island of Lampedusa in Italy to precisely talk about immigration. And his uh, uh, 
uh, teaching over there was basically telling us that we cannot forget that our brothers and sisters that are, are migrants are, are human persons, are really our brothers and sisters. So we need to protect people, especially children and the elderly and those in need. But more than that, we need to protect and defend the idea of the human person in our society. It is not any exaggeration to say that right now, our culture is facing a crisis of anthropology. The Supreme Court's marriage decision revealed once more that our society is confused about much more than the true meaning of marriage, the family and sexuality. I think underlying these confusions, there is a more basic confusion. I don't think we have any idea anymore in our society of what human nature is or what it means to be a human person. And I think this is rooted in our loss of the sense of God in our society. So these are some of the things I want to talk to you about today. And I want to begin by recalling the great American servant of God, Dorothy Day. As you know, my brother bishops and I are promoting Dorothy Day's cause to be canonized as an American saint. And I found it providential that earlier this year, our Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI chose to talk about Dorothy Day in his final public audience before retiring as Pope. It is fascinating to reflect that he chose this lay woman from the 20th century America as the last example of holiness that he wanted to propose to our church. I know many of you know Dorothy's, Dor Dorothy Day's story already. It's one of the great conversions stories of modern times. What makes her story relevant to our conversation today is that her life tells a kind of spiritual diary of the 20th century. She was born before the dawn of the century in 1897, and she died in his twilight in 1980. And when we look at, at her life now, we see that it was Dorothy's day destiny to experience firsthand some of the century's most influential ideologies and movements, feminism, communism, and the sexual revolution. So in terms of our conversation, what all of these moment, movements have in common is a distorted understanding of the nature of the human person. If the church finally finds her to be a saint, Dorothy Day will be the only saint who, prior to her conversion, had ever written about her own abortion. But her search for truth left Dorothy open to God's grace and the gift of faith. She came to repentance, confessed her sins, and was baptized. She went on to lead a transfigured life in the image of Jesus Christ. She became our country's more, most radical witness to Christ's love for the poor and his call for us to be instrument of his peace and justice. She criticized, like a prophet, America's failures to live up to its high ideals. Now, the story that I wanted to tell you is this. One night, Dorothy Day was in Arkansas, where she was giving a speech on the rights of farm workers and African Americans. But when she was done that night, she came, back to, she came back to her room and she felt totally overwhelmed. She felt a terrible sense that what she was doing with her life and ministry didn't really matter. 
that she would never see results. She was feeling desperate, and she started to pray. And this is what happened. These are Dorothy Day's words. And suddenly, a most wonderful sense of the glory of being a child of God swept over me. So happy a sense of my own importance that I have reflected on it since. I will pray that you have it and grow in it. This sense of our importance as sons of God, divinized by his coming, all things are possible to us. We can do all things in him who strengthens." End of quote. These are beautiful words. And they give us a place to begin thinking about the foundations of Christian anthropology, of our own vision of the human person. As Catholics, we believe every man and woman is God's creation, made in God's image made to become his divine sons and daughters, his children in Jesus Christ. In our tradition, the human life has a God-given makeup. We are created as unity of body and soul. And, wh and who we are is crucially related to our sexuality, to whether are made male or female. Now, what is going on in our culture today is the almost total rejection of this idea of the human person. We can see this most obviously in the debates about homosexual relations and marriage and the controversies over transgenderism. What's going on is that we are living in a culture of extreme individualism. And people believe that they have the ability to create and recreate themselves through science and psychology, especially in the areas of their sexuality. They don't see their lives as a gift, but as a kind of raw material from which they can modify and refashion according to their own desires and their own sense of meaning and purposes. In the words of philosophers, people today believe they are self-constituting autonomous subjects apart from any relationship to God. Well, that's a big topic for another day. <laughs> so what I want to talk to you about next is the roots of this disordered anthropology. As I see it, the root of the problem is our, own, uh, our, our growing forgetfulness of God. As we all are aware, American society, along with the other societies in the West, is becoming highly secu secularized. The memory of God has already faded from many people. New generations are growing up without any religion. We are fast becoming a society of practical atheists. It's not a criticism, it's just a description of reality. And when we forget our creator, we forget what creation means. We lose, we lose the sense of our own meaning as his creatures. And that's what is happening in our society. If God is not our father, then we are not brothers and sisters, and we have no responsibility for one another. But the loss of God has even more personal implications for our sense of meaning. When we lose our sense of God, we lose the thread that holds our lives together. We lose the answers to the questions that help us make sense of the world. What kind of person should I be? Why should I be good? Why should I be living? Why should I be living for? 
and why? Many of the elites in our culture today will argue that there are no true answers to these questions, just different opinions, beliefs, and preferences. But we know that that is not true. We know people need those answers. Without those answers, we do not know anymore what makes a human being human. In his first encyclical, Lumen Fide, Pope Francis writes about this in almost poetic language. He writes, and I quote, once man has lost the fundamental orientation which unifies his existence, he breaks down into the multiplicity of his desires. His life story disintegrates into a myriad of unconnected instants, an aimless passing from one lore to another, plethora of paths leading nowhere and forming a vast labyrinth. This is where we are in our culture today, my friends. We have disintegrated the idea of a human person and reduced it to whatever we wish, we wish it to be. And this cultural situation, this, this is the exciting and, and um, uh, um, challenge that we have. This cultural situation suggests a mission for us. I'm coming to see that the new evangelization must include a new presentation of Christian anthropology, a new proclamation, how our beautiful vision, uh, proclamation of our beautiful vision for the human person. God has entrusted us with the beautiful truth that the human person is sacred, that every man and woman is created in the image and likeness of God. It's a beautiful saying from uh, one of the church fathers, St. Irenaeus. The glory of God, he says, is man fully alive. Moreover, man's life is the vision of God. Just a few weeks ago, um, I was invited to talk, to give a talk in one of the synagogues in Los Angeles. And I was talking about this, uh, the importance of the human person. And I came across the beautiful saying uh, in the Jewish tradition. I talk about, about it in that uh, presentation. That says, and it gives us the, the idea or the importance of the human person person created in the image and likeness of God. It says, a procession of angels pass before a human being wherever he or she goes, proclaiming, make way for the image of God. It is really beautiful to think that the angels are coming in front of us saying, make a way for the image of God. That's who we are. So the men and women of our times need to hear this good news. They need to know they are the glory of God, created and destined for the vision of God. They need to know that they are God's image and that everyone they meet is God's image too. We need to be the ones who tell them that their lives are not trivial, that humans are not, not just random beings contingent products of evolution, going through life with no why or reason. Our task in this moment, as I see it, is to restore this appreciation of the sacred image of the human person. We need to bring this truth into our homes and neighborhoods and churches. We need to proclaim to our society what both the old a New Testament affirm that each human person comes from the loving thought of God, 
that we are all made for holiness, that we are made to live as God's image in the world. So we need to help our neighbors to see that all our lives are not our project, but God's project. We are God's work of art. That by his grace and his law, God wants to make each of us more like him day by day. In our Christian tradition, our lives have a beautiful uh, direction. Jesus shows us who we are. He shows us that we are children of God, born of the love of the Father. We're born to love and to be loved. And we do that by loving as Jesus loved. The direction and purpose of our lives is to become more and more like Jesus through the grace of, through the grace of God and our desires for holiness. The Catechism of the Catholic Church puts it beautifully. The vocation of humanity is to show forth the image of God and to be transformed into the image of the Father's only Son. So, my dear friends, I am convinced that this truth about the sacred image and destiny of the human person is a key to the new evangelization. We need to make this truth the substance of our preaching, our religious education, our work for justice. So let me stop here and close with another quote from Dorothy Day. I chose this quote because it also reflects her profound sense of Christian anthropology. She wrote these words about the birth of her daughter. I was, she wrote, supremely, supremely happy. If I had written the greatest book, composed the greatest symphony, painted the most beautiful painting, or carved the most exquisite figure, I could not have felt more the exalt, exalted creator than I did when they placed my child in my arms. To think that this thing of beauty had come from my flesh was my own child. Such a great feeling of happiness and joy filled me that I was hungry for someone to thank, to love, even to worship for so great a good that had been bestowed upon me. Beautiful words. We are indeed creating the image and likeness of God. We are the beloved sons and daughters of God. So this is the beautiful bishop of Christian anthropology, the vision of the human person as the image of God, called to share through our human bodies in God's own divinity and in his work of creation. So, my dear friends, let us look for new ways to share this beautiful vision with our society, which needs it so much today. Thank you, and God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. It's just terrific. You're spot on. Thank you so very much, Archbishop Gomez. I, I have to say, um, you're just spot on. And uh, I have seen so many times in my own life, my own uh, religious practice, and certainly in uh, my religious mission, I can just say that this one idea has such incredible transformative power. But as Archbishop Gomez says, we not only have to understand that we're made in the image and likeness of God, we have to believe it so hard that we'll live it and we'll give it away unto the transformation of culture. 
And, and when we do, and when we believe in it that much, because it's not only written in, in, script, in uh, Christian scripture, but when it's written in our hearts, we will have transformative power and culture. I think that's certainly a, a, a testimony of Archbishop Gomez's life and certainly my own. So thank you once again, Archbishop Gomez. Absolutely. Amen.